storytelling show that I'm going to be doing this Saturday, April 2nd at the Pine Box Rock Shop in Bushwick. It's at 8 p.m. It's a free show, so I would really appreciate uh, if you were able to make it, if you could come out, because um, this will be my fourth time doing it, and it's at a really good place, and I'm really happy with the progress it's making. It's, it's, it's earnest, it's honest, and from what people have been telling me, it's funny. So if you're looking for something to do on April 2nd at 8 p.m., I'll be at the Pine Box Rock Shop doing my one-man show at 8 p.m. So I hope you can make it out. Um, on the show today is a comedian and all-around affable, genuine, awesome dude, Dan King. Um, me and Dan, I have worked with him a bunch, and this was uh, the first time we sat and chatted for a really long time. He's got a, he approaches comedy differently from the way uh, most people do, but it's still really, really funny and really unique. And I got to talking to Dan about his, um, I also got talking to Dan about his uh, early childhood growing up in South Jersey. And I got to learn a little bit more about what goes behind uh, such a genuine and wacky uh, dude. So. I really enjoyed this conversation, so I hope you do too. Let's go to my chat now with Dan King. Exactly. I find, I find like, you said the word content a second ago. I find sure. nothing makes my dick softer, my comedy dick softer. <laughs> Than like the words content and the word shareable. <laughs> shareable, I'll agree with you on. No, yeah. I like content. Content, as in like, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I don't have, I don't have expensive equipment. I just don't. And mm -hmm. but guess what? I'm smart. I have smart friends. I have smart, funny guests. Yeah. And we're gonna make things that are entertaining. We know what we're doing. We just we don't have the money yet. Exactly. I, I, I think we're I can separate things that way. Exactly. But that's the. I, but I, I love that. I love the. Uh, how we're all our own like minor threats, and like comedy has just minor like, threat is a band. Minor threat is a band. Like there's as much as I know about minor threat, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about minor threat. Uh, they started in D.C. in the they 80s. were all miners um, in the coal mines of D.C. <laughs> <laughs> all those coal mines of D.C. Well, uh, where's that season? No, they're like a cards. DIY punk band, right? Yeah, they were like like what is it like D.C. and having like sick punk. See, I don't know much about punk music, but I know a lot of awesome bands have come out of there. Oh yeah, like, and and like lots of like iconic people from the punk rock scene, like uh, yeah. your Henry Rollins and Ian MacKay. Uh, Bad Brains, I think, and then I, I think they moved up to New York. Are out of D out of DC. When when people when people talk to me about punk bands and the punk scene, I feel like the way my mother must feel when I talk to her about rap music. I'm mm -hmm. just like. I, you seem excited by this, but as far as I know, it could all be made up. I really don't know. Bad Brains, that's another band. Okay, that, is cool. a, that is another band. Black Flag, that's their flag? No, that is that's band. another band. That Henry is band. Rollins, I know. He said that thing about roadies. He like did him. say that. He did say that thing about roadies. He said, you could say Henry Rollins said a lot of things about a lot of things. You well, probably could say that. I think the reason that there's so much great punk rock out of D.C., yeah. um, and specifically the kind of bands that were coming out of D.C., because there's always an inherent... Uh, political slant to most I was a, yeah, of those I was about bands, to say, yeah. and maybe punk rock in general. Um, I don't want to pigeonhole the, all every band that I don't think it's crazy to rock. say. But it's yeah. like right there. If you're in, D, yeah, if you're in exactly. D.C., it's 
a part of your everyday life. Yeah, that you just, by virtue of being in D.C. and you're just watching government happen, I think it probably primes a lot of people to be like, when I make my art, I want it to have a message to it that I think is important. Right. That makes sense to me. All right, I understand punk music now. Thanks. Well, well man, I'm so glad I could help out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that that's... Let me ask you this, uh, Dan. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that your your environment growing up at all influences what you do now, comedy wise? At all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or do I feel like there was like a moment where I was like, I have shed everything about my environment growing up. Right. Like, were you <laughs> were, were you running from something? No, no. I was. I've never been running from. I, I I mean, to sincerely answer your question, yeah, of course. I think my environment growing up has shaped everything about. Mm -hmm. Who I am now. I'm 24. I don't. I couldn't possibly have had enough distance. You're 24. From my time. Yeah. How old I, did you think I was? I always, assume, always a fun answer to this. I always assume everyone I meet in comedy is like my age, which is 20. 20. I, I'm turning nine? 30 in a month. Got it. You know, Ian just turned 30. Yes. Me yes, and Ian. Ian Kitchen. Uh, we're, we're, we're. This is it now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, we okay. we started. We we uh, got. We figured out punk music. That's the start. <laughs> Great. That's the lead in. Uh, Dan King talks about punk music. All right. Uh, That's your next podcast. Ian Kitchen turned 30 on Monday, and we had a great day. We uh, went to the Comedy Cellar to watch mm -hmm. the early yeah, show, yeah. and we got really excited because Stephen Wright was there. He was just, like, oh, chilling Wright upstairs. Was... Yeah. Oh, how so, cool. So, like, we saw him uh, upstairs at the bar. Ian, sa Ian fanned out and was like, oh, I'm a big fan, and he was really nice. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the start of the show, he was sitting in the back, and we're, like, nudging each other, like, hell yeah, Stephen Wright's going to drop in. And then he didn't, which is his prerogative, but we were disappointed. Yeah. We were like, oh, that's such a tease. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stephen like, Wright oh, is the... here. Just give him the microphone. Oh, I wonder. Oh, well, I wonder. I bet he's in, in town. Maybe he's doing a – because you know, he's on Horace and Pete's, right? He somebody said he had a show coming up in Boston. Like uh, I think somebody said the Beacon Theater is doing that soon, and they were like, "Oh, maybe he's like Beacons in New York." What? What's the one in Boston? The Wilbur. All right. I uh, saw. I saw. Uh, I've been to one show there. I saw Garfunkel notes there. It was like one of the f funniest shows I've seen. Yeah. Oh, they're they're hilarious. They're hysterical. They have a. Don't they have a show now, or do they still have it? There they was, had like at least one season. They of had a season IFC on, show, on right? IFC. Yeah. yeah, I haven't watched that yet, but I'm sure it's funny because they're great. Yeah. So, so you were, so you're at the, you're at the comedy. Oh, cellar. that was the, that was the entirety of the story. That we was watched a really good show at the comedy cellar, and then just the shadow of Stephen Wright was over the whole thing. Gotcha. And that was it. Yeah, because I think what we were, we were talking about is like age. I, age, and like you're. You're younger than I than I, I imagined. I'm you younger be, than you, even though you ready. seem like you. Because I just assume everyone's the same age. I as have me. the problem of I've always seemed a little bit older than I am. Which, like, when I started out doing comedy, it was nice because I started out when I was like 19, 20 doing stand up stuff, mm -hmm. and it was great because like nobody questioned why why I was hanging out at a bar or whatever. Sure. And and that was that worked out beautifully. Uh, but then, like, I think I just still seem like I'm a little bit older than I am, and it's starting to be like, n no, <laughs> no, now I want to seem younger than I am. 24 right. is fine, but if I'm, like, 30 and people are like, yeah, you're 40, right? That's going to bother me a lot if mm -hmm. I'm still there. I hope I just always seem like I'm 21, but I think I'm past that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I don't feel, like, I don't feel old um, unless someone you, tells me I you should. You seem younger than you are. You really? Ha your face, you have a lot of, uh, not a lot. Your face seems like the face of a man who is just entering his 20s. <laughs> and you and you walk with sort of a you have a nice bounce to the way you seem mm -hmm. younger. You I understand why you think we are the same age, but for the opposite reason, I think of you as being very close to my age, even though we're not that far apart anyway. Yeah, it's more. I think we more or less have some of this similar, same life experiences. I would imagine. I think so. I miss punk music. Yeah, apparently. Well, I picked <laughs> up on see, I picked up on what I guess a lot of people would call real punk later because I my formative years I was I was a. Uh, listening to all the pop radio friendly pop punk like you're like blink 182 are my favorite bands oh i remember blink 182 Love them so much my when i was growing up like musically me growing up it was uh i grew up in south jersey in the suburbs okay uh, i was a, getting ready to ask that which is a great state for this for that kind of music for oh yeah yeah. yeah. there's for, a lot of i like punk and alternative in new jersey uh i had a weird uh, when i was in like I mean, around the time that The Chronic came out, 
right? Yeah. Like I was in a Catholic school in the suburbs of New Jersey filled with little white kids mm -hmm. and we all loved Dr. Dre all of a sudden. And Eminem uh -huh. as well. I don't know why we loved Eminem, but God knows we did. Just, I'm just kidding. Just Eminem's did. awesome. Uh, but like when those albums came out, like rap was the thing we were all into. Like the way that, like if you, people look back on it now and they're like, man, it's so weird they were selling rap to white kids at that time. I was living uh -huh. it. We loved it. You couldn't have kept us away from it. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. What do you think excited you about it? Well, for one, I mean, like, I've gone on this, uh, like, in my, in my life, my musical tastes have definitely grown and evolved. And, like, when I was a kid, I was into rap because, like, everyone was into rap. And mm -hmm. then I sort of got into other stuff and eventually started just making my own decision musically. And once I started doing that, I started getting back to hip-hop and being like, actually, this is, there's a lot of good stuff here. And I can look back and say, like, we were getting really, like, it's great that we all listen to The Chronic, you know? Right. It's all great that we listen to, like, Marshall Mathers LP. Like, those are great records. I'm glad we listened to them. Yeah. Uh, but it was, we were just doing it because we were kids, and that's what was on the radio, and we thought it was cool. Right. Was it The Chronic 2001 or the, the original Chronic? This was, this would have been 2001. Yeah, yeah. That was the one that hit us that we were, like, into it. And it definitely did spawn, it did like spur a lot of people to like get into like Death Row Records and uh, just mm -hmm. stuff that was uh, part of that whole scene. Oh, but then, so that happened, that happened to us in 2001, obviously. But after that, like my cohort of little white kids started listening to like Weezer and Fall Out Boy and stuff. And hmm. that was, that was what people formed bands around. You yeah. know what I mean? When you get to like late middle school and you can make a band, right. they were like, post hardcore pop punk bands yeah that was what it, it seemed it seemed for me at least i heard i heard i remember listening to bands of that ilk like yeah and in hearing power chords for the first time and thinking oh yeah. that's i like the way that sounds that's exciting i want to learn how to make those sounds yeah because i don't know too many people in my in my high school and middle school that listened to to rap and thought and and wanted to rap it i don't know it got um I knew people who wanted to start bands, didn't know many people who heard rap and wanted to become rappers. I knew, so when I was in high school, I knew a lot of people who were into, who were still into like hardcore, post-hardcore, pop punk, that sort of mm -hmm. angle of things. And then when I got to college, I started doing spoken word poetry. Okay. And that got me really plugged right back into hip hop and into listening to like stuff that was happening around that time like i was in college at the perfect time to be way into odd future when that first uh -huh. started happening and that was a lot of fun and i also started like uh there's a lot of uh there's a lot of overlap between spoken word poets and rappers uh people who are aspiring oh, yeah, to do both of those things so uh, i started getting connected with people who were into those scenes which was pretty cool mm -hmm. and i think I, I i'm at a place now where i'm very comfortable listening to a lot of different stuff which i think is great and just like appreciating uh, appreciating artistry above anything else, above like any specific genre. Interesting. Yeah. So you kind of, you can look at things that maybe aren't that super close to you and still appreciate the mechanics and the craft that, that goes into that. I think I, if that's a skill, then I'm very good at it. I uh -huh. really, like I've talked to, I think I've talked to you about this before. I've like, uh, obviously I'm not a musician, I'm a comedian and, mm -hmm. um, uh, when I watch someone performing comedy, the first thing that hits me is the craft behind what they've done. Mm -hmm. And like looking at like, I can understand that you chose all these words and I can see what you're doing. And I, if I think it's good, then I think it's good because I'm impressed by the choices you made. And then like a secondary thought to me is like, do I relate to what you're saying? Mm -hmm. uh, which, yeah. I, which is nice because I can appreciate a lot of different comedians but i do think it's it's tough because like thinking about relatability is like the last thing i think about when i'm writing because it's the last thing i think about when i'm watching comedy i don't care if i if i dan king relate to this i just care if it's funny right and then that's a problem because i don't i don't make stuff that's very relatable yeah <laughs> because it just of, doesn't matter to me i'm just like it's funny just be quiet right you i would i would describe you and and we've I'm very interested times. to hear how this sentence ends. You've seen me a bunch. I, I, I have seen I have seen you a bunch. I, I you strike me as someone who knows like the craft of traditional stand up, 
yet works ar around it in a u really interesting way. Thank you. I like to, when I make things, I like to respond to like comedy that already exists. I like to mm -hmm. be like, which uh, I appreciate yeah. because I think, I think sometimes uh, there might be people who who go for the hard Andy Kaufman approach, <laughs> but forget the to forget the to be who either forget to be funny or don't like <laughs> or couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Kaufman, but you forget to be funny. You realize that's just a sociopath, right? That's just a <laughs> monster of a person. Right. That's just like stabbing someone to death and being like, no, 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 no. It's a joke. It's not a joke. Not a joke. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying? Or like I do. Or or like people, or maybe like bands that would go describe themselves as dissonant noise core. Oh man. But not because not by choice yeah because they genuinely can't do yeah, it. Like, yeah. I, think, I just like, don't know how to play a guitar so i'm just punching it and that's why it's dissonant like right. that's not a choice but if you know how but but the thing i think i like about you is you know how to play the guitar but you're but you're gonna punch i'm it. deciding to play the guitar by ramming a trombone into it because i think it's funny like i'm i'm deciding to do it in a weird way yeah uh, which is which is good i, like I think that. at my best i aspire to do what you're describing I think at my best, that's mm -hmm. where I get, and I, I hope I get there a lot. I, I sometimes think I think well, I fall off and just well, go you're like weird one, places. Well, one of my favorite time, times comedy-wise I've had relatively recently is when you were on my show. Oh uh, man, do you want to get into that whole thing? I, I really, I, I know really exactly. Do. What you're like we'll talk about, about yeah. you, like we'll talk about like your life and, and family nah, and stuff. Who cares? But this is I've done way of, more interesting things. This is the stuff. That, this is no because so. I, I've meant and I've mentioned it before, but I've got a I have a monthly show at the Creek in the Cave you called You Can Use. Very fun monthly show called You Can Use That. Yeah, and you asked me if you wanted to do it, and actually you, I believe what you I pitched did an was, idea to me. What so I, what I believe I did was I sent you a message, and I think it started with. I have something that you absolutely must put on your show, or something to that effect. Was yes. like I didn't ask you; I told you I have something. <laughs> yeah, and I was sort of <laughs> that you must do. Yeah, uh, and the thing is, uh, and what we ended up doing, which was a lot of fun, was so I guess it was this happened to me last summer. Was I was in uh, Central New Jersey? I was dog sitting for a friend of the family. Uh, and I was like living at their place and watching their dogs for like a week. And in the middle of it, uh, they were in uh, West Trenton, New Jersey. In the middle of it, I was like, I need a haircut. Uh, so I looked up like the nearest barber. And uh, and this is like a little, like I'll throw in all the little details of mm -hmm. this just because, you know, we have time. No, yeah, I think it's important. Uh, I did like, I, you know, I Google search for like barbers near us. It's a rural area. There's not much around, mm -hmm. but I found two barbers right across the street from each other in the middle of nothing else. And I was like, yeah. that's weird. It's like the barber district. So I drive down there and I see that there's one barber shop on the right that's got a bunch of cars in front of it, and then another barber shop on the left with no cars in front of it. And Ooh, I'm it's like, the barber shop version of a Robert Frost poem. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, well, barbershop less traveled, that's the one I should go to, no line. <laughs> so I pull up, I walk in, there's one chair in the whole barbershop, which was amazing, and there's a guy sitting in it, and when I walk in, he stands up and he looks very surprised to see me. Uh, and I'm like, are you open? And he's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I sit down, it's this old white guy, he, which will be important, uh, he's cutting my hair, he does a great job, and uh, we start having a conversation as you do and he's like, oh, what do you do? I mentioned oh, I live in New York I'm a comedian and he lights up. He's, he's very excited. He's like, oh, I love comedy and I'm like, oh great And I'm not like like I know a lot of comedians who are like I don't want to talk to you about what you think about comedy I do I mm -hmm. think people have really like an older person probably has seen comedy You can't even imagine right and sure enough like this guy comedy that doesn't even really exist in the yeah, world Yeah, anymore. exactly like this guy. He's telling me about like He's going through different late night hosts. Like he's seen Carson, you know, all the way up to today's late night hosts. And he's telling me what he thinks about these people. Wow. He saw Jonathan Winters live. He saw uh, Bill Hicks, uh, like coming through New Jersey. I'm like, tell me about that show. And it's, oh, it's amazing. Wow. Uh, he's, he's got a lot of great comedy stories. He seems like a really nice guy. Uh, he cuts my hair, does a great job. We have this wonderful conversation. We're all done and I, uh, I go, oh, thanks, I'm going to pay him and leave. And then he goes, hey, hang on. And he reaches into <laughs> his uh, drawer, and on top of his drawer, he's got a stack of papers, like old yellowed papers. And he goes, here, you can have these. 
and I look at it, and it's uh, it's about 400 one-liners. It's like a little writing packet. It's like mm-hmm. 400 one-liners. And I start to read them, and I read a couple, and I realize that these are the most racist jokes I've <laughs> ever even thought about. They're the most <laughs> offensive things I've ever seen, just on the first page. And I sort of look up to him, and I don't know what to say, and he goes, use them in your act. People will love them. <laughs> Classic. I'm really flabbergasted. I like handed my money silently and I go like, did you write these? And he goes, nah. And I'm like, all right. And then I walked out with this grip of papers. I took it home. I read every single one and they're just astounding. Do you want to hear a few? I yeah. Got, I have my phone here. I can pull it up. Let's, let's do, let's do a few. I have a, uh, because, I, because you sent, you sent this to me as a PDF. I did. And we're like, this you, you this has to be done because on your show. honestly this is too per and you tell me this as if like I had removed them from a sacred space as soon as I got them they started to fall apart mm-hmm. and I uh, I did some research on them uh, there were a couple of jokes that like dated themselves they referenced like certain TV shows so these I'm pretty sure were written in like the uh, early 80s. I'm early pretty sure. 80s. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Based on, what was it? There's a reference to, uh, I forget which like TV game show that only ran for like two years. So I was like, it must be around then. Because well, some of these, I, when I, like, and just to pr- preface, like some of the racism in some of these jokes, it's I, old timey. I, I was thinking like back to like the, 40s or 50s. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, it's it's tough like to Like, the gauge. joke that you're doing now is, like, when white people were racist to other types of white people. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of jokes at the expense, expense of, like, Italians and a lot about Jews, a lot about black people. Uses a lot of words that I don't use. Uh, <laughs> but let's just go through a few. Um, uh, do, do, do. Oh, okay. Here's, here's like, perfect. Here's, a, here's about how racist this stuff is. And I can't stress enough that I did not write this. Right. This is. If from, you don't believe me, please from stop the, listening. This is from uh, the drawer of a South Jersey barbershop. From the drawer of a barbershop written by not my barber, according to him. Who knows? Uh, here's, no here's one off the first page. Uh, why are scientists breeding Mexicans instead of rats for experiments? I don't know why, Dan. Uh, because they multiply faster, and you don't, yeah, and you don't get as attached to them. <laughs> yeah, which is rough. That's, it is. That's rough. a rough but thing th- to. Th- do that's you a feel rough. that. That's yeah, sad. Do like it feels wrong, and, but it, there are variations of that bit that are still going around in comedy oh, yeah. clubs today. See, like what like bothers the, we're me. We're looking at this is this is probably. This is a historical document. Oh yeah, I want to. I, I sent this to the Smithsonian, and they just sent me back. How did you get this email address? So I don't think they're gonna take it. Uh, but there are some of these that I do think are genuinely funny. Like, what's the definition of endless love? It's Stevie Wonder versus Ray Charles in tennis. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that, that that's, racist. That's not. That's not really racist. That's I don't, more yeah, of a joke that's about not blind people. At all. If it weren't so close to like. You could uh, switch out any two blind people. If it weren't the on the same page as this joke, what's a Jewish American princess's favorite wine? I want to go to Palm Springs. <laughs> if it weren't on the same page as, as, as that, that joke, one, you'd be ready to be like, this isn't racist at all, yeah. but it is. Well, I guess Palm Springs was the destination. And then, uh, and then just. That joke was written. Like, one last thing is my favorite. Uh, thing about this is there's a bunch of like running themes Mm -hmm. and here's my favorite like it pops up in a bunch of jokes here's one Uh, what do you call a Greek man with 10,000 girlfriends I don't know a shepherd (laughs) and then here's another one why did God invent women why because sheep can't cook which, oh, classic. And which, I'm laughing because I'm uncomfortable. Of course, I'm very <laughs> uncomfortable just saying these things. But I do think it's funny that, like, whoever wrote these, like, takes as a given that we all want to fuck a sheep. Like, he starts... Right. The starting point for the joke is, we yeah. all know we'd like to yeah, fuck everyone, a sheep. Uh, yeah, we all everyone go... Everyone wants to fuck like, a sheep, but yeah, you we know can't you really fuck say a, it. Yeah, you want to know, know how you fuck want to fuck a sheep, right? But there's laws. That's this guy's, like, social message is, like, we should be able to fuck sheep, I think. <laughs> I think. I think separate all the races and just let us bang sheep and we'll be fine. <laughs> but anyway, but if you ever see me... Can you imagine? I have those jokes on my phone. I can show them to you. They're really astounding. Uh, oh, that's, and, and that's they hysterical. Hurt. They hurt. Yeah, in places that I didn't know I could hurt. Yeah, but every well, time I look well, at that, the, the hurt I think is a sign of like a social conscience. I really you hope know? so. I like to think like 
it hurts you in the bone that like a Donald Trump supporter doesn't have. You know how they did that study? They showed yeah. that Donald Trump supporters have one fewer bone. I think yes. it's the bone that makes you uncomfortable when something racist happens. Ex I think it's exactly. that Exactly. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty sure Trump could drop some of those into a, into a speech. And, I'm pretty you know, sure I've heard some of these in his speeches. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah. We, to, to be If I grab honest. the paper and I like... If I like rub lemon juice on it and like hold it over a light, and all of a sudden just Donald J. Trump like uh -huh. appears at the bottom, like aha, we knew it. <laughs> uh, I, my theory behind why he has not been sto stopped yet by anything that he's said or Hit done, me. yeah, is because you know, like, like uh, Patrice O'Neill brought this uh, uh, idea up on on WTF, yeah. Um, his WTF, which is one of my favorites, he brought up. He was talking about like um, Michael Richards and and mm -hmm. and Paul Rubens, uh, Pee Wee Herman. So like they their public image was like kind of fun and family friendly. Sure. So that when uh, these hypocrisies about them were revealed, or they revealed them about themselves. Well, when they did something was, we don't like, when they did something society doesn't like, right? All of a sudden, it's a big deal. Yes. My theory is Donald Trump has been a piece of shit the entire time. I've never thought of him as wholesome or right. good or even very nice. Yeah. So everybody, so, so everybody's you can't just tag seeing that, what you can't tag that guy been. with. You're a racist asshole because he just comes back to like, yeah, of course you knew that when you started yeah. watching The Apprentice. Right. What are you it's talking like, about? and what's yeah. I, I feel to your point. I've never said I wasn't. Yeah. What's gonna happen? You know what? You know what would have to happen? It would have to be <sighs> revealed that he like donated like money to AIDS relief in Africa or something like that. <laughs> and have his supporters be like, that doesn't fit. Right. Yeah, that doesn't he, fit our narrative. He would have to do something incongruous with his public persona. But what even would that be? I don't even know. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And I, I don't follow politics enough to be like really informed and smart like yeah. a lot of our peers seem to be. I, um, I, but I think it would have to be like, or what's? Oh yeah, I should talk to you about this because I I came I uh, my mom came to like town if it the other revealed day. like he's yeah. the owner of Jezebel or Slate or so, or like any sort of very like like a pro woman thing even. I guess but what, it, I guess if it came out that he is Hillary Clinton, that would probably hurt him <laughs> or with someone I don't know who. But I my mom's that's, in town the other funny. day and we okay. were talking about Donald Trump and we we're both. I mean, you can call us pussies if you want, but we're both legitimately pretty afraid. And we've agreed, like independently, we came up with our plan is to move to Toronto if okay. Donald Trump is elected to anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so I should talk to you about that. how hard would that be um, to move to Toronto? I want to, if I wanted to suddenly move to Toronto. Okay. Let's say within a few days of okay. the election, you, just you, like I don't want to wait around to see him inaugurated. Well, I'd start. You, you should start. I have now. a valid passport. Yeah, get the make sure passport's valid. You need to have. A, you need to have a, a, a system of support uh, set up. You need to have I a, should start making friends with Toron Torontians. What are they? Yeah, make, make friends with people who are in Toronto. Prove that you're going to be, uh, you'll need to be able to show that you'll be a, a, a good s member of society in your community. You'll need to have All a job. Right, let, let's sure just say that that stuff. might be tough for me. Let's just imagine that I might have trouble convincing anyone that I'm a positive effect on okay. their community. Okay. <laughs> Is there a way around that? Um, uh, you can you can write a letter Does saying Does my that last you're sorry. name get me anything? I know you're still loyal to the crown. My last name is King. Will that get me any like can I uh, maybe no. trick someone into no. thinking I'm the king? Possible. Possible. All right. They they I'll are loyal shot. They are still loyal to the crown. That's right. I've got my Trump escape plan too. Yeah, where um, are you going? Uh, I might go back to Barcelona. Ooh. I, I spent some time yeah, there. Yeah, that's right. I spent some time there, and I really enjoyed it. I have a, the plan all figured out. So That would be fun. So my girlfriend is a in addition to all of her jobs that she's had, she's a really good cook. Okay. So our thought was go open a restaurant. Open up a restaurant in Barcelona, sure. Have a comedy show. I'll have a comedy show in the basement. Yeah. I'll, I'll be part of the growing Barcelona comedy scene. I've heard, oh, man, when those Barcelona guys come to town, it's like don't follow them because they're right. just murderers, you know? Yeah, so I do that. And then as my side thing, because, you know, I'll run out of people to do like a normal one-on-one -on -one podcast <laughs> with, I guess start doing a soccer podcast. Oh yeah, that's a, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Man. which is the one sport I know anything about. So I, I'm pretty. I'm just I'm thinking of remember. Uh, and get uh, this. You and I are both new on the uh, Midnight Vultures pinball team, and the other day yes. we had a we had a match at uh, a bar in the village, 
And up on the TV when we walked in, I noticed they were playing uh, soccer news on mm -hmm. one of the Spanish channels. Yes. And we had our match, which takes like, what, two and a half, three hours? Something like that. And yeah. I look up and like towards the end of it, it just dawned on me like, they've been showing soccer news and highlights this whole time. Whole time. This has been one show. One show. Soccer news and highlights, with the exception of there was one point where they literally just cut to big chested women jumping. I remember that. <laughs> For like 30 seconds? Yeah. Not an ad. Not an ad. Not an ad. Just, just part of the show. Big chested women jumping. And then they're like, all right, back to the soccer. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a lot of fun. That, that will. I'll come on your soccer podcast. Awesome. Talk about the union. What's up? Uh, the, oh, the Philadelphia Union? Yeah, or I guess I'll become a Toronto FC fan. Ah, yeah, Toronto FC. In this alternate history, in this alternate future, I'm a Toronto FC fan. All right, sounds sounds good. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. They, they're coming out pretty. They're coming out pretty strong. <laughs> I I don't. I think the Union are not this year, but I could be wrong. I haven't checked. I think they just won their first game. Well, so it's. It's journey of a thousand steps, you know? True. Or whatever. True. Whatever you, that saying is. Do you follow soccer at all? A little bit. Yeah. I, I like keep loose tabs on the Philadelphia Union. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of care about how the English Premier League's going. And then I'll watch like Champions League matches. Okay, I, I, cool. like, I like sports a lot mm -hmm. in general. So I'm comfortable cool. with like whatever sports are on, I can watch. That's fine. Awesome. Have, have you always been into sports? I think so. Yeah. yeah. When I was. Um, when I was uh, like one and two years old, my parents would take uh, me and my sister to a lot of Phillies games, cool. uh, my older sister. And I, like my, my dad loves this. When I was two, I could name everyone on the Phillies roster from memory. And mm -hmm. he, he took out like the, you know, the old like behemoth video camera that you shoot family. He has an old VHS tape of me listing off all the names of the 92 <laughs> Phillies, which was an amazing team. Nice. Uh, and, and I loved baseball. And, you know, and then, like, we did the... Excuse me. Uh, we did the South Jersey Suburbs thing of, like, you're, mm -hmm. you know, that's what you do is you play sports. You right. play sports. Because you're... Boy Scout. Yeah. Yeah, because so, you're close to Philadelphia, so that was probably... Oh, yeah. I, I went to high school in Philadelphia. I went to a uh, great mm -hmm. school in my town in New Jersey, and then for high school, I went to an all-boy Catholic school in North Philly uh, called St. Joe's Prep, an amazing place. I love that place. That was the first place I did stand-up, actually, was at a, battle, was at like your, a talent at your high show school. at my high school. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, and you were 19, you said, when you started stand-up? Or maybe so, younger than So, that. like, I did, I did that. I did the talent show when I was, whatever, 14 or 15. Sure. And then, you know, I was like, I killed that. I'm going to take a few years off, really, but rest on my laurels. Right, right. And then uh, when I got to college, I started doing improv comedy and some other creative, persu uh, creative pursuits. Uh, I wrote for, like, a comedy newspaper. Uh, I did uh, spoken word poetry. And I, like, I had always thought that stand-up was a thing I would love, but just, I don't know, it was that mm -hmm. thing of like, I don't know what it was like for you, but like before I started stand-up, I almost, I felt like I was waiting for someone to say to me like, hey, do you want to do stand-up? Right, and you just needed a yes. reason. Like you, maybe you didn't want to, you were like, oh, that's, you yeah. didn't, you were afraid to maybe do it the first time, but if you had a reason, like someone offered you a gig or someone asked you to do it, you'd do yeah, it. Yeah, then you're like, yeah, I would totally do stand-up. I'd be great at it. And then uh -huh. eventually I got to a point where I was like, oh, no one's going to ask me. Why would someone ask me that? That's such a weird question to ask someone cold. I should just do it. And then I got yeah. started. And I was, uh, I think I was almost 20 when that happened. Okay. Almost, I was either about to turn 20 or 21, and then I was in stand-up in earnest. Interesting. Okay. So you... So you're a sports kid. You're growing oh, yeah. up, growing up in South, football, South Jersey, baseball, soccer, all of it. Interesting, because when I look at you, I do not picture a multi-sport athlete. Oh, 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 and that's not an insult. That's just you don't those... you don't read as that to me. I was on a Although lot I'm of very teams where they didn't like cut kids from the team. That okay. that's why. I was I was on the football team in high school. <laughs> Sorry, I have the sniffles. It's... I hope this is not disgusting. It's uh, cool, to man. people. <clears throat> uh, I was on the football team in high school because my high school was small enough that if you wanted to be on the football team, you were on the football team. I was awful. I played guard, mm -hmm. and you're looking at me, and I was smaller than I am now. 
Right. And I, I was guard because when I showed up on the first day, they were like, can you catch? And I was like, no. And they was like, can you run? And I was like, no. And they were like, can you throw? I was like, not really. And they were like, okay, you go with the big guys. You go over there. That's where you go. And then they just would light me up. And, but, I mean, I liked, I liked football. I still like mm -hmm. football. So I was like, I'm going to stay on the team. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll grow six inches and 100 pounds overnight. Never there, happened. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, I was kind of the same way. Like, I wasn't allowed to. My parents wouldn't let me play American football because they were afraid I'd get hurt. So I was really? on T ball and and soccer. And uh, I showed up to soccer practice, and they were just kind of like, "Well, he can't run, <laughs> um, and he folds under pressure quickly. Yeah. So he's going to be a defender, and we'll put him in the goal when we're four game points up." <laughs> See, I had, hmm. I had a. Uh, almost an inverse like trajectory where when I was a little kid I played soccer because you know we, we live near a soccer field let's go play soccer but I, when I was like eight from the ages of like eh, five to like 12 13 I was just like a ball of anger and energy uh -huh. that just like didn't have any direction to it so when I would play soccer I would just nail people too often uh -huh. <laughs> like I would just see someone who wasn't looking at me and just light them up and eventually they stopped yeah. allowing you to do that and they were like you you should not play soccer anymore and that was when i was like well let's try football because i mean at least i'll get to just hit people just hit people but just really what i learned is anger what out. i learned is like with my body at the time and even now like among peaceful people i was the biggest most violent kid but among the kids who wanted to hit each other i was the smallest worst <laughs> one <laughs> which is the bad side <laughs> of that trajectory yeah no it's not a good place to be <laughs> right so gosh i didn't I, did, I would have never thought any of this about you like it, i would i would imagine you as being like a somewhat somewhat bookish artsy type would uh, you cut would you hmm. what well let me ask you this mid-teens mid-teens yeah. and angry so that's that's a i'm familiar well, with, I'd, I'd i'm familiar with it. that where's where where do you think that's coming from Dan? well i had worked through i had worked through being angry by the time i got to like a, a, towards the end of my freshman year in high school basically i mean really football helped a lot with it because uh when i was it's a definitely kid, gonna physically tire you out well when i was a little kid like i would just get angry about stuff and it's so bizarre for me to look back at it now because now i'm not an angry person no. I, I i'll get excited about stuff but i, I don't get angry at people or events really mm -hmm. uh, but when i was a little kid i just like i didn't have any sense of like how to handle things and react to the world so i would get angry a lot and i think football helped a lot because it like showed me like god i don't i don't have that kind of a body you know like i, mm -hmm. I can't be that person who's always trying to like fight someone because uh -huh. i'm gonna lose a lot of them and it won't yeah. be good so before i managed to really go down that path i realized like i better i better figure out how to not just get angry in response to everything and mm -hmm. how what to like were actually have feeling uh, like freshman year in high school so i was uh that's a very 13, mature realization for for that young uh, well, you know, I mean, you own a mirror, and you just and, look into it, and you're and like, and you see yourself getting just the shit beat out of me every day at football practice. And at a certain point, you realize, like, God, that might just be who I am. Uh, but uh, yeah, but so by the time I, by the time I really like got to being a teenager in earnest, it was almost this weird thing where I was like, I've, uh, I've spent so much time being like a weird kid and I'm weird because like I just I don't know how to like channel feelings I just don't I know mm -hmm. angry I know not angry I don't really know other stuff right and then as I'm going through high school I I'm like learning uh learning how to be calm and react to things and how to mm -hmm. make stuff and how to like how to actually be happy mm -hmm. does that make and sense yeah, and what were the the things that were were helping you do that? Uh, two two things I want to know. I want to know what your like home life is like, like brothers, sisters, oh, yeah. anything like that. And then also, what were the <coughs> things? Because this is really interesting to me as well. Because um, I find that I I would not describe myself as an angry person e either. I wouldn't but either. But I. I can, I can, I've definitely had those moments where I'm just like, where I feel like my feelings get hurt and I start to get defense and I get defensive, which yeah. leads to anger. Mm -hmm. Um, I do, I'm pretty good about not displaying it outwardly, 
but what were some of the things that like what were you what was going on during that time and what were the things that helped you kind of wrap your head around your feelings intellectually yeah and cope with well cope with i mean it. uh so my family i come from a from a great big irish catholic family mm -hmm. uh it's uh my mom and my dad uh i have an older sister i have a younger brother i have another younger sister uh my, uh, I think I've mentioned this to you, my uh, older sister and I have been living in New York together for about two years the whole time I've been here. We're actually mm -hmm. just now moving into different apartments for the first time. Uh -huh. So like, uh, we... <laughs> so you're close. We're very close. We were, we were talking uh, the other day. Our plan was when we, we had been living in the same apartment. Now we're moving like uh, this month. And we agreed that she would get a dog and name it Dan, and that I would get a cat and name it Colleen, which is her name. Uh, but then the apartment I found doesn't allow pets, so it all fell apart. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> That's adorable, yeah. dude. Uh, and uh, my, my brother's in, uh, he's a senior at Notre Dame, uh, is gonna graduate in a few weeks. Uh, my little sister is at uh, Washington University. And mm -hmm. we've, we've been a tight family, really our whole lives. If for no other reason than we are a bunch of goddamn weirdos. We just are. Uh -huh. We we understand each other in ways that other people just can't because I don't know. I think we we all have different stuff, but mm -hmm. it adds up to like I relate a lot better to my family than to other people. You guys just know me better. Does it, it, like, yeah, you you've spent the more time with them, so it's not that they we're know your quirks. And well, what. not even that. It's as it's as far as like we were each other's best friends growing up, and we uh, we're close enough in age that we're we've always been connected. Uh, and like my strongest connection is always going to be with my brother, just because like when I was just a weird little kid who didn't understand how to talk to people, I mm -hmm. could still talk to my brother. I, I still could. Right. Even when I couldn't muster a friendly conversation with another person, I could have one with my brother or with sometimes with my sisters and then sometimes with my parents, but my brother for sure. Uh, so we, we've always been very close. And, uh, oh, yeah, I, you asked about like what put me on a different path yeah I, I yeah on. i was curious like what how are you able to because i would rap? say i would say like going into high school i had this weird thing where in my head i was a star athlete who just hadn't hit my growth spurt yet okay and and i was going to figure that out and i was going to be either a great swimmer or a great football player and i wasn't old enough to understand that that's not a thing that's mm -hmm. not a thing right and uh, that like and also that like I did hit my growth spurt. I hit it in about eighth grade. I'm as tall as I'm gonna be. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and like uh, I I just hadn't realized yet that I was gonna need to do new stuff. And I do remember really clearly I had uh, I had started to hang out with like a groovier crowd of people who were like everyone in my old boys school cared about sports, but we weren't all star athletes. And I mm -hmm. started to hang out with people who were into music and art and other stuff. Yeah. And there was this guy and I. Uh, I will always love him for doing this. I, I had thought of him as kind of a weird dude. Uh, and we weren't, we didn't hang out all that much. Brendan Mattox, if you're listening, thank you so much for doing this. One day I'm like eating lunch and he's at the table and he just like offhandedly mentions like, hey, we're going to this concert tomorrow night. You want to come to the show? Mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, yeah, why not? I'm not doing anything. And it was, uh, the band was of Montreal. I know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, like on which... on Halloween. So nice. so it was of Montreal and everybody in the crowd was at their most like groovy and funky. Uh mm -hmm. everybody's in costume. It was the first time I had ever gone to a concert that wasn't classical music and it was the first time I had ever seen people who were like like to me up to that point I was like I knew I was weird but I was like, so I got to try to be normal. So I got to, I got to right. try. You to have to out. fit in with yeah. your surroundings. Yeah, exactly. I have to like look at the people around me and be like, what are they doing? And I'll, and I'll try and do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, that's I'm familiar with that feeling. And this was the first time that I saw a bunch of people who were like, no, 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 no. We're weird. We make weird stuff. If you don't like it, fuck off. That's it. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to be who we are and that's okay and it's going to be cool for us and if you don't like it then it's not for you and that's fine and i remember that concert just like planting the seed of like maybe it's okay for me to think more about just 
making art and interesting stuff and to like care about writing, maybe it's okay for me to be that and not mm -hmm. to put all my eggs in miraculously becoming an amazing athlete or something in that uh -huh. sort of path. And that like, it didn't all happen at once, but that did sort of start me off on right. like, maybe I should be a really broke mm -hmm. comedian who lives in Bushwick and I just make weird stuff for my <laughs> friends. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> Oh man, Bushwick is where where you, that's it's where that's it's at, at yeah, man. dude. That's I, that's where I moved to. Yeah, that's great. That's great, man. Because it's it, that moment when you when you have permission suddenly to yeah. indulge the weird thing that you think is on, only you. Yeah, that yeah. you can't really tell it. That you don't really tell anyone else about. To finally have the permission to be that is a really liberating moment. And then that sets you on the course for everything else you're going to do it almost and i don't want to i don't want this to come off too judgmental but it almost like when i see people who like clearly grew up in an environment where like they got that message right from the jump where mm -hmm. people who are like yeah my whole life people have always uh you know said to me like follow your own path do your own thing like i think that's great but i almost feel like if you didn't have it and then you came to it mm -hmm. like it's not that anyone ever said to me you can't be a comedian quite the opposite my parents are incredibly supportive so is the rest of my family mm -hmm. my brothers sisters aunts uncles they're all amazing they love that i'm doing what i'm doing and i yeah it's i'm so thankful for that but like the fact that i had that moment where i was like i'm gonna consciously decide to do this i think it's nice to have that touchstone to come back to to be like there's a reason i'm here and it's because there's something inside of me that likes making this stuff and i just yeah i want to keep making it yeah. yeah. No, I'm I'm the same way. It's like I just want to keep creating and yeah. I want I there's so much like I want it to do and put out that I just I I get I have I, and you know me pretty well. I'm pretty m chill, dude, but I oh, have yeah. like these manic episodes where if, if I come oh, okay. up with something I'm really excited about, I'm just like holy shit. Yeah, yeah, and you just work on it. Like do you have do you have like uh just all of a sudden you just haven't slept for a couple of days? And it's not that you're yeah. like or you're not on a bender or anything. You're just I got excited and I've been making this thing. That's yeah. it. Yeah, like when like I'm not like I haven't re I haven't been doing too much with music lately, but when yeah. I was doing a lot of stuff with music and my old roommate and me and Benel Jermosen were writing songs constantly, I would get the inspiration and I would just go oh my gosh ch -ch 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 -ch. Yeah. and then I would go to them and be like alright and it's gonna be like this and it's gonna be like this and then you've gotta come in like that and then the music video yeah, it's all like just this. up like, here I and just, it just came to me in one thing yeah I, ju I do the whole I have the whole creative I have the entire board meeting with the mm. A&R department of my mind <laughs> <laughs> I do uh, cause you know I do uh, test pilots it's a writing project where I yeah, write so let's talk about some of the stuff you do every, every month I write a pilot script for a a TV show that doesn't exist and so writing uh, a TV show script every month is kind of a lot for like just one person to do but what you what you need to understand is like it's not I'm not smart I don't write a little bit every day and mm -hmm. then at the end of 30 days have a script I write like a little bit and then I get busy and then I forget and then I just go play pinball instead and then <laughs> and then there's like a day when it just clicks and I'm I'm just going to sit down and not stop writing because I I've, I've got it and then I and then I've got the script and then I'm going back and I'm like all right well let me fix this cuz it was 5 in the morning when I wrote this and it's not totally mm -hmm. together but like it it happens on one day on the day when it just grabs me and then there's a lot of ancillary stuff to it does that make sense? Like that just yeah. it hits you and then you just go because it's there and and that's it. It's just the most important thing in the world all of a sudden. Oh, absolutely. Like some of the this one man show I've been working on. Yeah. Um, I will get like the last time I did it, I made huge leaps and added a whole bunch of stuff and stuff I was scribbling like day of. Oh, yeah. And it made these like it made the show like instantly so much better and now I have and you know I go and I have to make notes on the tape yeah. so I remember to add to because th that's how I'm working on it I'm doing it like once a month trying to build it up so that I could maybe start booking it rapid in rapid Do, uh, sorry sorry booking your one man show like yeah. finding talent for your one man show Oh, it's just finding <laughs> venues for it. I'm just imagining you being like, hey, uh, can you do a good Will Carey impression? Uh, I'm booking <laughs> this one man show written by Will Carey. 
<laughs> if I, in my head, you're pretending to be a third person. Yeah, I'm. Pre- <laughs> it's like I just create like the live a version of that Bob Dylan movie for myself. Yes, that would be amazing. You want to do a one man show where it's like thirty people and they're oh all playing God. the same one man? That dude, you should do that for your next test pilot. Yeah, just do like a guy casting a one man show of himself. That would be great. Oh my God, <laughs> can I do? If you do that, can I be on that one? Yeah, totally. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm yeah, growing dude. that one. I've got um. I know I've talked to Momo's going to be on. Momo's going to be on it. So nice. we've got to figure out someone that you and Momo Puja could both play without okay. me getting tarred and feathered. Okay, without you getting tarred and feathered. Okay, so something that both me and him... i got to get him on here, too. I want to talk. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I want to talk comedy and soccer with he's that very, guy. He's another Philly guy. You should definitely have him on here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like him. I want to... Cause he I like, have an inherent love of anyone who has ever even been close to Philadelphia. It's just, yeah, you're, you're my like when I started doing stand up, I started it in and around Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. That's just my I love that place. Yeah, what what places did you did you start? Because I'm curious about Philadelphia's comedy scene. Because there's like r- there's really funny and really famous people there's that are from Philadelphia. Like yeah, yeah. When I was um, like uh, when I was. Uh, just starting out, I we would always know when uh, Todd Glass was coming to town mm-hmm. because he was like, people know him and he's and, and rightfully so because he's amazing and also he's like very nice to young comedians and like yeah. he, like you could maybe get him on your podcast. You know what I mean? Like I knew right. a couple of guys that got Todd Glass on their podcast and they were just over the moon. Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, when I started. Uh, when I started doing comedy in Philly, it was, uh, sorry, uh, I had been away at college. I took a year off. I was back home. Oh, man, this is just bad. It's cool. Do you w- want me to get you a tissue or something? Mm. I have a pack of tissues here. I think I just need the water or the tea. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I was uh, back home. Um, in South Jersey, and I would go to. Uh, remember the first open mic I went to? Uh, it's called Laughs on Fairmount. Uh, it was at this place called uh, Urban Saloon. Okay. Uh, where they had this huge uh, venue. It was a bar, and then they had this incredibly large back room. And the the awesome thing about Philly is um, there's enough people there to have a whole scene, but and it's a big enough city to like you you can put on serious stuff uh but it's a small enough scene that you can put a lot of energy into your open mic and into like getting people to show up for it okay so the open mics there the a lot of them would have like real actual crowds there like right better crowd than you would get at just like fill in the blank weekly bar show is just chilling out to watch all the Philly comedians just try stuff out, which was amazing. It's such a great like way to start out. Yes, it is. And uh, pretty quickly, I started. Uh, I like formed uh, a little team with a few other people, uh, with uh, Brian Six, Tim Ramis, uh, and Andrew Spasato, uh, who are three other Philly comics. Andrew's as last I checked was not so much into it, but Brian and Tim are still uh, grinding out in Philly. They're amazing. Uh, and we started running, uh, we've run shows and open mics first at this place in uh, Northeast Philly called Kern's Irish Inn. Then we moved to this, uh, then we started this amazing run where uh, we would run an open mic at a place for, uh, for a while. And then uh, the place would uh, uh, boot us and then close immediately. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, one was on 21st Street, I forget the name of it, where we ran an open mic, and that, the guy running that, uh, the guy that ran that bar was just a jerk to us, uh, and uh, eventually, like, he, we sat him down, and we were like, look, we're bringing in, like, 50-plus people to your bar every mm-hmm. week, we think you should give us some money for that, maybe. Right. And he went, "I should be charging you a hundred bucks for the space." And we were like, "That's eh, wrong." And yeah, so I... we split, and then like within a month they were closed. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we moved to this old gay bar called L Two on South Street, and sadly they closed uh, uh, because we just we just weren't enough to keep an entire business afloat. Right. Uh, but all of those open mics were so much fun to do, just because like. Uh, 
it uh, the 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 scene really cared about them, and you uh, the you as like you were running your room, you really cared about this, and you really turned it into like I'm gonna get better. I'm gonna get better at comedy so I can make my open mic better. I'm gonna figure out how to promote stuff. I'm mm-hmm. gonna get better at that. I'm gonna like I've got a real crowd of people here. I'm gonna figure out how to tell jokes to people. Uh, I I love doing that whole thing. Yeah, Th- that's great to hear because I'm. It took me a while to come around to that was be a way to to do it because when I first got to New York. And maybe I had a bit of this when I was in Baltimore, too. Like, I, I, I got in at the... Because when I started in Baltimore, it was really tiny. There yeah. was, like, the, t- the two clubs that, one, you could maybe do New Talent Night at, one, you couldn't really get in unless you, like, knew someone. And there was the one really good booked uh, bar show that had a paid headlining spot. Oh, wow. So, so those were, were kind of your options. And But when I got to New York, I... I've, and I'm trying to, I still have a little bit of this. There's a, a masochist part of me that feels the need yeah, I know to you're be a comedian. accepted. <laughs> <laughs> to be accepted in the traditional two drink minimum comedy club environment. Ugh. And it's, it at times often feels like a, a rigged game. And yeah. like you can't, that's impossible to win. Yeah. But hearing stuff like that and, and, and reading all, all so many are, and reading articles about how all of the really new and exciting stuff is not happening in those rooms. I, I just nodded my head and sort of it's, raised it's my kind eyebrows. Of, I realize that doesn't play on a podcast. It's, uh, it's cool. It's, it's kind of inspiring. Um, one thing I want to ask you. Yeah. Did you have a, a, what was your arc into getting to where you at, are at now? And do you see, what do you want to do with your stand-up? What do you want to, gr- what are you hoping to grow into as a, as a stand-up? Hmm. Did That's you have a learning curve? Um, like, were you doing more traditional jokes or hmm. stuff when you started? So I guess, like, like, to take, like, a really, as long as I could possibly take of this, like, my arc is, as a little kid, I, like, became aware of stand-up comedy. Uh, like, my, uh, my house growing up didn't have cable until I was, like, 16, I think, 17. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I, uh, on like times when we were near someone else's TV, like on vacation or at grandma's house or whatever, mm-hmm. I, I like discovered Comedy Central and started uh, like seeing stand up on that thing. And I remember just being like, wow, that's a thing. Like uh-huh. a person just stands there and tells jokes and everyone laughs. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And that really intrigued me as a little kid. And yeah. so it was always on my mind of like, that just seems like the coolest thing ever. And then like, as I, as I got older, I got more and more comfortable with the idea of me being creative. And I started doing, uh, I started uh, doing comedy writing, started doing improv comedy, but it's always like in the back of my mind, it's like, but stand up is the th- thing that I, that really gets me going mm-hmm. and then eventually I like got to the point where I gave myself permission to just do it you know and now yeah. now I'm really jazzed about that and so at that point for me the for me the exercise becomes okay I I like stand up comedy I listen to it a lot I go to shows a lot like I uh, I've seen a lot of stand up comedians mm-hmm. certainly enough that I can go like well, I like what Eugene Merman does, and I yeah. really like what Lenny Bruce used to do, and I really like, uh, I really like a lot of Andy Kaufman's uh, stuff. Like, I think what they do is cool. I like that. So let let me look at the world as it is now. Now, how can I do my version of that thing? Mm-hmm. And I think. Like anyone, when I first got started, I'm just really concerned with doing anything, and then after the first couple of years i started to actually make choices and right. i think right off the bat right off the bat my choices were well i like making my own stuff i like mm-hmm. that i like having control over what i'm doing i that just uh pleases me a lot uh i don't think that my stuff jives well with a club audience mm-hmm. now, i don't want to uh I certainly have nothing against anybody who finds, like, find your audience wherever it is. I'm yeah. not sure that mine is hanging out at the club, you know? I think yeah. uh, my audience might be the folks that are at the coffee shop or whatever. I'm pretty sure that's where they're hanging out. Uh, 
Yeah, you're, you're the type of people that you can vibe with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or the the type of people that'll give me like a really long leash to do something that's strange and weird, and it might be half baked, and it might have some ideas in there that are weird or challenging. I I think that like when I have an audience that lets me do that stuff, that's when I'm the most happy with what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, like once I'm starting to make those choices, like I spent some time in Nashville and I would just gravitate towards like alt rooms, weird venues, and to just putting on my own show wherever I could. Uh, when I was in Philly, that was what caught my eye. I would gravitate toward that stuff. Now I'm here in New York and I'm still just, I'm gravitating towards places that give me that kind of permission to, uh, to really explore what makes my head weird. You know, uh-huh. and I, I I just like being in that space where it's uh, things that even I don't fully understand, but I know they make me giggle, and I'm pretty sure they're going to make my friends giggle. And I like just exploring that. I'm still very happy with just I'm going to try a lot of weird new stuff, and as long as it intrigues me in the moment, I think it's groovy. Was that an answer to your question, or did I just say a bunch of words? No, I think that's a I think that's a very groovy way of going <laughs> about it because I think without the uh, the added pressure of a high ticket price and yeah. uh, the expectations of uh, of laughs every thirty se- uh, of laughs every thirty seconds because when when I'm doing close up I'm doing trying to if uh, times I'm in a club I'm trying to punch jokes really quickly and get yeah. to a lot of laughs. But you need to be able to also have places where you can uh, almost like like stretch, like a comedy yoga studio. Yeah, yeah. Where you can stretch you and, and discover new things. Well, yeah, exactly. You need to be able to explore. And like, uh, uh, like if, you're, uh, if you're listening to this and you're uh, uh, maybe coming in a little bit cold to like comedy inside baseball stuff, mm-hmm. like he's not saying like every, laughs every 30 seconds like – He's not just pulling that out of nowhere. Like, no, literally, when people, when, if you go see somebody at XYZ Club, they have sat down and they've thought to themselves, how can I make these people laugh every 30 seconds? How yeah. can I do that? Yeah, I don't there's get an to actual go. industry term about laughs per minute. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I, it is a given that I don't get to go more than that long without saying a funny. Like, uh, I remember being, uh, it really caught my attention. Do you remember, um, oh, shoot. I forget which Patton Oswalt album it is, but it's the one where he tells a story about going to get Plan B at a Walmart. That was uh, Werewolves and Lollipops. Thank you. And it's the one where someone yells out in the middle. Exactly. Of he has like, there's a stretch of a story where it's he's talking in a low tone for like a minute. Like mm-hmm. not even that long. Not even that long. Not even that long. He's talking in a low tone for a minute and he's about to get to the next punch. What's up? Uh... He's about to get to the next punch, and but before he can, someone shouts out in the audience. And I remember, like, obviously, it's in the record because, like, fuck that guy who yelled out. But I remember thinking, like, no, seriously, you can't let an artist talk to you for more than 30 seconds without saying a punchline. You can't just uh-huh. let that happen. There's, like, what's going on in your head? You're, just relax. He knows what he's doing. Right, you you paid a ticket price, so he's probably thought this out a little yeah. bit more than yeah, you're giving exactly. him credit for. And uh, and uh, I think, I think if I was if every time I did stand up, I was in front of a crowd that got antsy every thirty seconds. I mm-hmm. don't know how fulfilling that would be to me. Uh, yeah, if, if, I think I certainly like like I I'm a you know I I. I care a lot about the craft of comedy i mean if that's the project if that's the only way to do comedy then so be it then i'll write for that but i'm pretty sure there's other ways to do comedy including relax let's explore this this is going to be something new and different and it it might make you laugh every 30 seconds it might not because it's new it's it's something different and let's try that i don't know no i think it makes perfect sense man totally I like I like where your head's at, and I like uh, the times that we've worked together. Oh, absolutely! I, I we, love I working with you. You're you're great. You're the gentle giant of New York comedy, and it's fantastic. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. I, ca- I call I'm I call the you the dozenth ex- person I, who's called you that. Right? That people say that to you probably more often than you would like. I, I'm I've, sorry. I've been called gentle giant before, but I yeah, I, sure. I, 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 
I enjoy it. Yeah. I'm 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 gunning for I'm I'm the niche I'm trying to carve out is that straight white guys who are the smallest part of the problem niche. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying. That's what I'm trying to I be in that. my life and on stage. I'll have fun. I'm, I hope there's room for me in that niche. <laughs> Hopefully. I. Uh, thanks for talking to me, Dan. I really hey, appreciate it. Hey, no problem, it. Matt. Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to be here. Uh, I'm gonna go home and just punch myself in the sinuses. Uh, okay. Because sound, that'll feel better. Sounds sounds good. And one one question to close out. It's a it's a short one, and then maybe we'll. I'll. You should come back on. We could talk more about this topic again. Yeah, of course. Okay. Um. Currently, there are seven games left in the English Premier League. Do Leicester hang on or not? Where are they at now? Could we pull they're up at the, the top, standing? They're at the top of the table. They're five points above Tottenham. Five points above Tottenham. I mean, it all depends on the game. I, w I won't lie. I haven't looked at who's matching up where. I'm, I'm certainly impressed. Like, when you told me just now they're still at the top of the table, I'm shocked by that. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it's been the biggest story of the year, and I'm utterly flabbergasted that they've done that. Good for them. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I hope they enjoy it. I hope they enjoy their Champions League berth next year. I think mm -hmm. that's all great. Do I think they'll end up top of the table? No. No, no just because, God, this is... It's too you know, good of a story. Like, Cinderella can stay out till midnight. She can maybe stay out till 12.05. But gosh, it is 5 in the morning, Cinderella. You gotta, you gotta get <laughs> home. You know what I mean? It's a pumpkin yeah. again. You're gonna have to walk home now. Do you get that? No, I, I hear you. It's, yeah. it's, so, it's so perfect and so awesome to watch. As someone who doesn't God have a strong emotional do. connection, yeah. I don't have a strong emotional connection to any Premier League teams. Me I either. liked Chelsea for a while because Mark Hopp is from Blink did, but oh, then okay. Momo uh, talk, has effectively, and I want to talk to him about this, effectively talked to me out has of it. turned you off talked to me out of it. He was like, he was basically like, oh, that's Rich London. Well, he can't root for Rich London, and, yeah, and most of the fans point. are racist. Now, you don't <laughs> like racism, do you? Well, to be fair, I feel like you <laughs> You could say that about a lot of English. That's that's true. <laughs> so we'll we'll have to I'll have to we'll have to come, you'll have we'll to come talk back on. We'll soccer. talk when you're in Barcelona more. in November. We'll just talk about uh, English Premier League soccer and the Spanish teams. It'll be great. All right, sounds Thank good. Thank you so man. much for having me. Well, Thank you, been Dan. A lot of fun. Appreciate it. All right, groovy. Peace. <laughs>